Well, welcome to our ongoing videos from chapter two on loads. We're in section two dealing with the classification of loads and uh, we just finished talking about subsection two on dead loads and subsection three on live loads. And now we want to talk about processing dead and occupancy loads to get uh, a form of load that's useful in sizing members. For example, if we want to size a beam or some other spanning member, we typically want to convert area distributed loads to line distributed loads along the members. So we're going to derive a formula that says that the line distributed load along the spanning member is equal to the area distributed load on the floor times the spacing uh, between the adjacent spanning members. So all that will become much more clear, but keep in mind, we're starting with these area distributed forces, which are prescribed in the codes or that have to do with the area distributed load associated with, for example, a floor slab. And we're converting them to some form of load that's useful in the sizing of members. So columns are going to be sized for the total axial force in the column, which will be expressed either in units of pounds or kilopounds, which we call kips. Beams are going to be sized for line distributed force that they support in units of pounds per foot or kips per foot. Trusses may be sized for the line distributed force that they support in units of pounds per foot or kips per foot, or sometimes they're sized, depending on the analysis procedure that we used, we use for the force on each vertex. So you can imagine that the vertex of the truss is handled more like a column and that we find the total load that's associated with that vertex in units of pounds or kips. And that would be typically the way we would do it for truss girders because truss girders will have other joists or other trusses that come land on their vertices of the girders. So there'll be discrete forces, whereas the decking that rests on truss joists tends to be uniformly distributed along the length of the joists. Now I'm flying through all that really fast. We will come back to it uh, to make it more clear. But here we have a, an image of a floor. And right now we have two perimeter trusses and one interior uh, in a normal floor. Of course, we might have a really wide floor and it might have a lot of interior trusses. But to keep this diagram simple, we've just shown three trusses, two of which per are perimeter trusses and one of which is interior. So if we look at this interior truss and we ask ourselves, what's the localized or point force that's associated with that vertex. We would then say, well, this interior truss is supporting halfway to this perimeter truss and halfway to that. So the amount of floor that's associated with the interior truss would be of width five feet because the spacing between the trusses is five feet. So it's supporting two and a half feet towards this truss and two and a half feet towards that truss for an overall width of five feet. Now, if we're told that the vertex spacing along the truss is two and a half feet, then any given vertex such as this one supports halfway to the next vertex and halfway to the next vertex in the opposite direction. Or in other words, it supports a width of 2.5 feet in that direction. So the total floor area that's associated with this interior vertex is two and a half feet times five feet. So we see that calculate a calculation up here where it says area supported per vertex for interior truss. And that's this gray shaded area here is 2.5 feet times 5 feet, or in other words, 12.5 square feet altogether. Now the area that would be associated with the perimeter joist is less. It's going to be half that total area, but the perimeter joist, we're going to, we're going to kind of avoid that right now. 
um, because it's likely got other loads on it like walls that it's supporting and so the analysis of it's probably going to be carried out on a completely different basis. So we're going to do an example where we calculate the p-forces on this joint and then we'll come back and we'll look at the um, issue of the line distributed force. But right now we're looking for P. P is an uppercase P. That means it's a cumulative localized force on that joint and it will be in either pounds or kips. Okay, so for an interior truss, the dead load force P dead associated with one vertex on an interior truss, we'll express that as uppercase P subscript dead is going to be the pressure or area distributed load associated with the dead load or the decking times the area associated with one vertex. So if the dead load pressure is 40 pounds a square foot, which would be typical, for example, of a residential situation, um, we would then say the area distributed dead load is 40 pounds a square foot. The area associated with one vertex is five feet times 2.5 feet. And when we multiply all that together, we get 500 pounds. We can do the same calculation for the live load <clears throat> on one vertex of the interior truss, except we'll, we'll size, and excuse me, I should go back. This 40 pounds a square foot is the weight of the concrete and composite action floor slab. Uh, so this is not typical of residential. This would be typical of a commercial situation. All right, for an interior truss, we're going to deal with live load, P sub live, which is equal to the area distributed live load or the pressure of the live load times the associated area um, the area that's associated with that one vertex. So we write P live times area vertex and then the live load we're sizing for in this case is 80 pounds a square foot which would be typical of an office environment and that's again times 5 feet times 2.5 feet so it's a thousand pounds on that vertex. Now if we want to know the the factored load associated with uh, P dead and P live on one vertex we'd have a factored load of 1.2 times P dead plus 1.6 times P live or in other words 1.2 times 500 pounds which was the localized dead force dead weight force associated with that vertex plus 1.6 times a thousand pounds which was P live and when we run all those numbers out we get 2200 pounds so our safety factor is accounted for by the fact that we've jacked up these forces pretty substantially with the 1.6 factor on the live load and the 1.2 factor on the dead load. And now we can size this truss for this factored load by making sure that under this exaggerated force we don't exceed the yield stress of the material. As we mentioned earlier, we could do a loud strength design, in which case we would leave off these factors and we design just for 1,500 pounds, but we would design it so that the stress never exceeds 0.6 times the yield stress of the material or the failure stress of the material. Okay, so if we return to our trusses, and for the moment we're going to put aside this whole issue of what are the forces that we design for on a given joint, instead we're going to focus on a one foot length of truss. So we've drawn a portion of the floor slab that's one foot in this direction. It's still five feet in this direction because this truss has to support slab halfway over to the perimeter truss on this side and halfway over to the perimeter truss on that side. So now we are supporting on this in interior truss uh, floor area that's one foot by five feet. So in other words, each linear foot of interior truss is supporting an area that is one foot by five feet or five square feet. So now we can calculate 
W dead, which is the line distributed dead load along the truss in pounds per foot. So it will be the dead weight of the area of floor supported by one foot of truss. And then we're going to divide that by a foot of truss because we want it in pounds per foot. And W dead will equal the area distributed load of the slab times the area of the slab that's associated with the portion of the floor that's supported by that one foot of truss. And then we say, well, that area is the spacing between the joists, which in this case is five feet, times one foot because that's how we're getting the area. The area associated with that linear foot of truss is one foot wide in one direction, and it's the spacing between the joists wide in the other direction. This foot now cancels out that, and so we end up with the, the dead load pressure is equal to, uh, multiplied rather, times the spacing of the joints will give us W dead. So we write that formula as P dead times the spacing of the joist, and uh, I'm not quite sure why I switched to 36. This should have been 40. Uh, if I was consistent with my previous example. So, for some reason, I've switched horses here, and I'm dealing with 36 pounds a square foot of slab or floor uh, weight, and we're multiplying that times the spacing between the joists, which is 5 feet, and when we do that, we get 180 pounds per foot as the line distributed dead load along the interior truss. All right, so we just derived a formula that W is equal to PS. We did that right here because we discovered feet canceled out with feet, and we ended up with W dead is equal to P dead times S, which is the spacing between the joists. So this is a pretty important formula that we will come back to over and over and over again. So. You might as well look at it and get it straight, and it should make sense to you. It says that the line distributed load on the beam, or whatever the support member is, in this case a truss, increases when we increase the area distributed load, and it also increases when the strip of floor that has to be supported gets wider. In other words, the greater the spacing between the joist the more floor that each joist has to support and the greater the line distributed force. So common sense should help get this riveted in your head, but you need to look at it until you get it straight. So let's just look at units for a moment. W is in units of pounds per foot. P is in units of pounds per square foot. S is in units of feet. And so we see that unit wise, this whole thing cancels out. Now, this is sort of a, ble a, a brief diversion, but we do a lot of things like this where important quantities cancel out. Uh, for example, these feet units canceled out when we derived this formula of W is equal to PS. We earlier talked about the pressure of water on a floor, for example, is equal to the density times the depth of the water, or in other words, the height of the water column. We derived that, and in this case, this is pounds per square foot, that's pounds per cubic foot. This depth of the water layer is in feet, and when we cancel that feet with one of these, the units are consistent. Um, we do a lot of things in our culture like this, and this formula right here is one that all of you have heard in one way or another if you're alive in this culture because you've seen advertisements for watches for example that say good to 100 meters or 300 meters so what does that mean if they say the watch is able to withstand water pressure if you're a scuba diver down to 300 meters it means that you can go to that level before the pressure that you're experiencing exceeds the capacity of the watch. 
So for the scuba diver, they don't give you the pressure. They give you the depth. And it's understood that somehow the depth of the water column over your head is what's dictating the amount of pressure on your watch. And, and the scuba diver knows a lot more about his depth than he does about pressure readings. And so he's going to be monitoring his depth and he'll know whether he's ever intending to go more than 300 meters down. And so he will judge whether his watch is suitable for those applications or not. So here we have a linear dimension multiplied by this intensive quantity of density that gives us another reading. Here we have a linear value of spacing, which is multiplied times this intensive quantity to give us another intensive quantity. This is very common and you'll encounter these kinds of equations as you go along and you should start looking for the common sense patterns that make all these things uh, seem or more comprehensible. All right, so the line distributed live load along the truss will be now P times S. So we have this. If we have a live load of 80 pounds a square foot times five feet, that comes out to 400 pounds per foot. So if we summarize what we've gotten so far, um, we can say W total is equal to W dead plus W live, which is 180 pounds per foot plus 400 pounds per foot, which is a total of 580 pounds per foot. Now you'll notice I'm not factoring this. And the reason is that I'm about to go into a design table that is not based on factored loads. And we don't want to rewrite those tables. We just want to use them the way they are. And they are actual design loads that you're looking for. And those tables are going to give you safe trusses. And, and so we need to have the numbers lined up to correspond to whatever the numbers are in the table. So when we go on the table, the total load will be the top number. And the next load will be the live load number, which is this. And I've arranged these in the proper order because the last thing we want to do is flip them or get them confused. We want them exactly the way we're going to see them in the table. Uh, so we understand how they're related to each other. This 400, by the way, has to do with deflection. We set limits on how much deflection we're willing to tolerate under live load. And this has to do with people's perception of movement of the structure, or it may have to do with crushing of partitions underneath. But whatever we do, we tend to set as a standard rule some minimal deflection which as a routine we will not exceed. So the deflection under the live load should not exceed the length of the spanning member over 360. And this number, by the way, this right here, is a common sense number that some structural engineers came up with where they said, if we meet this criterion, people will generally not be disturbed by movement of the floor. So under live load, we'll have a certain deflection which cannot exceed the length of the spanning member divided by 360. And by the way, if you had a 30 foot spanning member, that's 12 inches per foot times 30 feet is 360 inches. 360 inches of length divided by this 360 factor would give us a deflection of one inch under that full live load. If the member is 40 feet long, this number would be 480, and then the uh, deflection limit would be 1.33 inches under full live load for that 40, 480 inch long member. Okay, so these tables give the self weight of the trusses which will take care of the total load of 580 pounds per linear foot and take care of the deflection issue 
under the live load of 400 pounds per linear foot. And by the way, I'm going through this pretty fast, but I'm doing it here so that you will understand why you process these numbers and how they'll be used in the future. So I don't expect you to fully understand all this stuff having to do with these tables, but I want you to understand the general nature of the process we're going through and how these things are going to unfold in the, in the future. So I'm saying, suppose we want to find uh, trusses to span 40 feet under the calculated loads in our example, which is a total load dead plus live of 580 pounds per foot and a live load of 400. So here's the, here's a table. Here we have some truss or we call them joist, truss joist. So we're calling them joist designations. In this case, this is the so-called LH series. 18 inches means, or this 18 in front means they're 18 inches deep. So everywhere we have an 18 in front, we've got an 18 inch depth for it. And here we have some things that are fairly esoteric that have to do with the weight. So we start with the O2, O3 and work down to O9. And here they give us the weight of that truss. So the O2 is 10 pounds per linear foot on its own self weight and 21 for the O9. And by the way, this says approximate because sometimes if they don't have exactly the members that they need in stock, to make you the lightest weight truss possible, they sometimes will substitute slightly heavier members on the theory that it will be better. All right, so if we look across the top here, um, we have clear span in feet. For 18 inch trusses, they don't even list a 40 foot long truss. For a 20 inch deep truss, they go to 40 feet just barely. So if we scan down here and we look at these two numbers, 575 is almost what we're after to handle the, safely handle the total load, which was 580. The problem is that a shallow truss that's only 20 inches deep is never going to be able to handle the 400 pounds of live load without excessive deflection. So we're going to have to go to a deeper truss to make this work. So we're going to go to 24 inch deep trusses. So you'll notice all the designations here have a 24 at the beginning. And now we're going to go find a 40 foot length. And when we scan down, you'll notice that this is the one that works. Uh, the governing issue in this case was live load because by the time we get done, we have way more uh, overall strength in terms of total load than we need. Um, we were trying to get up to 400 pounds for the live load and we went to 418. So we're just barely oversized there. But this 768 is way bigger than the 580 target that we had set. So... Uh, this truss, by the way, is not that uncommon in that clearly its design or sizing has been governed by the deflection issue. And you will discover that most of the time in the things that you build within your lifetime, the governing issue will be stiffness more than strength. And that's particularly the case here. So this truss which is strong enough to support 768 pounds safely and 418 pounds without exceeding its deflection limit weighs only 25 pounds per linear foot. So I just threw this in so you'd understand that we have ways of sizing spanning members especially really standard things like wide flange beams or standard fabricated trusses used in simple span mode, we have ways of quickly sizing them very reliably. And these trusses are just an example that I pulled out to show you how we are using little w 
which is the load on the truss in pounds per foot. That ends our discussion of processing dead and occupancy loads to get load information that can be useful in sizing spanning members. And a key thing you want to remember here is this formula W equals PS.